Hi guys, it is a lovely summer evening here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. I am a, I'm literally in the echo chamber of the doomosphere. You know you're in the echo chamber of the doomosphere when you have Kevin Sandbloom from uh, Black Bear News over there on Rockfin coming in through the walls while you're ranting about the collapse of a planet. So, uh, and I guess we have the cat. She's joining in. All right, we have a regular chorus of doomers. We have the cat. We have Kevin Sandbloom coming in. Welcome, welcome to Collapse Chronicles, Kevin. Uh, come see us sometime at Bugs in a Jar. And, uh, and of course, you know, people are telling me I need to start Apparently, I need to start telling what my name is. My name is Sam Mitchell. This is Collapse Chronicles. A couple of people are apparently confused about the Doomosphere. They're new to the Doomosphere. This is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. That is Rascal the Cat. And that is Kevin Sandbloom. And it is Tuesday. Day. No, it's, it's Wednesday. Good Lord, Wednesday already. July 13th, 2022, and uh, getting ready for another lightning bug show here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Got some folks from Beijing, China visiting, and they're looking forward to seeing a lightning bug show. So before that, I get into the lightning bug show with my Chinese visitors. Uh, doing what I do every day, and that's figuring out how to shrink the screen down. I don't know what happened here. What do you do? You control minus... What is going on? I have no idea what I have managed to do here with my computer screen. This is one of these touch screens uh, and I touch something on the screen and now everything has gone haywire. Uh, so anyway, what I was starting out to do was to read this uh, essay today in the conversation by some clueless moron uh, an economist, well obviously he's a clueless moron, some guy named Matthew Kahn, Kahn is right, from USC with his essay, What the Controversial 1972 Limits to Growth Report Got Right. Our choices today shape future conditions for life on Earth. I have no clue the editor or whoever who read this story how they got that headline out of this economist look back over 1972's limit to growth. It just is it, just an absolute, just predictable descent into uh, apocaloptimism and hopium, you know, from an economist's point of view. I do want to, uh, here's the last sentence, the last, this give you an idea of the, uh, give you an idea of the rest of the article. You can imagine if this is how it ended. Uh, Ongoing efforts to invest in climate change adaptation and nascent efforts to explore the potential of geoengineering, yes, provide humanity with additional strategies for coping with the consequences of our past carbon growth. I'm not going to insult your intelligence or Sancho Panza's with the rest of this article. It, it truly, 
uh, hurt me to, to read this. But anyway, at the end of this, you know, uh, if you like that one, check out this one. And they referred me over to an essay from the conversation from four years ago titled, A Long Fuse, The Population Bomb is Still Ticking 50 Years After Its Publication. And so I guess right now is the 50th year. I wish they would do an update. And so this guy is also an economist of some, some sort of environmental economist or something. Technically, this fellow's name is Derek, is it Hoff or Holt? I, it, it, the, the print is this big. I have no idea if this dude's name is H-O-L-T, H-O-F-T, H-O-F-F. But Derek Holt, Hoff, Hoff is the Associate Professor and Lecturer in Business and Humanities at the University of Utah and serves on the board of the Utah Population and Environment Council. That must be a, a pretty small board. I think that Utah is the fastest growing state in the nation but based on percentage, I think. And of course, the Great Salt Lake uh, is an absolute environmental catastrophe unfolding in the fastest growing state in the nation. And uh, it's a perfect uh, case in point from the population bomb. Is the, state of, is the state of the population and the environment of Utah. You don't need to read the population bomb. You need to go to Utah. Look out the window at the Great Salt Lake. Okay, save yourself. Uh, but but wear a, this is the one time I will recommend wearing a mask. If you go to Utah to the Great Salt Lake, you wanna wear an N95 mask. Okay, but anyway, take it away, Derek, whatever your last name is. A long fuse, the population bomb is still ticking 50 years after its publication. So at least this guy, he has it half right. And, and one more time, I am not endorsing everything this man says. He does have it maybe one third of the way right. I would like to uh, hear Paul Ehrlich's review of Derek's review of Paul Ehrlich. Okay, he starts out quoting Paul Ehrlich, the battle to feed all of humanity is over, Stanford biologist and ecologist Paul Ehrlich declared on the first page of his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, because, you know, according to Ehrlich, the quote, stork had passed the plow. He predicted, quote, hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death, close quote. And uh, in my interview with Paul, basically, I, I, you know, all he got wrong was the timing. Uh, as Paul said in our interview, that it is much worse than he ever could have imagined uh, in 1968. But you can find that interview, the first video I ever made here at Collapse Chronicles. Ehrlich's book identified dramatically accelerating world population growth as the central underlying cause of myriad problems. That is exactly what uh, accelerating world population growth is the central underlying cause of virtually every problem on the planet. From a food crisis in India to the Vietnam War to smog and urban riots in the United States, 
It sold more than 2 million copies and went through 20 reprints by 1971. Uh, Ehrlich appeared more than 20 times on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson and became the first president of zero population growth, a Washington, D.C. based at advocacy organization while remaining a professor at Stanford. And of course, he had one, you know, he and Ann had one daughter. I think their daughter had three children. Last I heard, she was up to three. The population bomb created more space to hold radical views on population matters, but its impact was fleeting and maybe even harmful to the population movement. By the early 1970s, many critics were savage, savaging Ehrlich and the larger goal of achieving zero population growth and the politics of mourning in America in the 1980s successfully marginalized Ehrlich as a doomsdayer, a doomsdayer. However, okay, he's, this guy is calling himself a historian. However, as a historian who has studied debates about population growth throughout U.S. history, I believe that Ehrlich's warnings deserve a new and less hysterical hearing. While Ehrlich has acknowledged significant errors, he was correct that lowering birth rates was and remains a crucial plank in addressing global environmental crises. Uh, it is the single most crucial plank. <clears throat> Ehrlich drew on nearly 200 years of thinking inspired by British pastor and political economist Robert Thomas Malthus in his 1798 study, an essay on the principle of population. Malthus famously predicted that geometric population growth would overwhelm arithmetic gains in agricultural production leading to wars, famines, and societal collapse. Fears of the potentially dangerous social and ecological effects of population growth intensified after World War II. Global population surged as a public health surged Global population surged as public health improved greatly in developing nations, increasing life expectancy. At the same time, the new science of ecology demonstrated the fragility of Earth's interconnected systems, and the Cold War promoted worries that population-induced poverty would breed communism. Mainstream advocates of arresting population growth emphasize better access to family planning and education, but Paul Ehrlich had no use for such baby steps. Quoting, uh, I, I do love this quote from Paul, well-spaced children will starve vaporize in therm thermonuclear war or die of plague just as well as unplanned children. <laughs> yes, they will. Uh, technological, technological optimists pointed to the green revolution in agriculture which had vastly increased crop yields up until the late 1960s, but Ehrlich echoing a growing chorus of farmers and agricultural scientists 
warned that pesticides ruin the environment and would eventually backfire as weeds and pests develop resistance. And of course, we're seeing that playing out over and over and over again. Uh, can you say dicamba? Ehrlich never called population the only variable. With physicist John Holdren, he proposed the IPAT formula, which describes human impact as the product of population, affluence, and technology. Nonetheless, Ehrlich believed that population was the key multiplier and massive reductions in global population were critical for human survival. And of course, uh, not to mention the survival of every one of our fellow earthlings. Uh, I, I, I admit I'm right there with Paul and above. I, 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 you know, I, I don't give a damn about human survival. I, I'm gonna be right up there with it. We need to go. Uh, we need to uh, say hasta luego and say goodbye. It's, uh, so who gives a damn uh, if, if massive reductions in global population are critical for human survival? It's the survival of every other species of earthling we share this planet with whose number one enemy on this planet is humans. Anyway getting back to uh, Derek's. Uh, Ehrlich hoped that a combination of policy carrots and sticks would reduce fertility sufficiently and preserve voluntary family planning, but he held out the possibility that coercive measures, including compulsory sterilizations might be needed. And I 100% endorse that, obviously, uh, the voluntary human extinction movement uh, is, is preferable over the involuntary. Okay, uh, but, but uh, you, you, you know, Guys, but obviously it, it, it's never, you know, it's never going to happen. Uh, okay, then of course, he had a little bit of backlash uh, coming out, uh, pointing out that coercive measures, including compulsory sterilizations, might be needed. <clears throat> Millions of Americans shared Ehrlich's anxieties in 1968 when the population was about half of what it is now. Concerns about the ecological impact of global population growth had helped birth modern American environmentalism. Feminists cited overpopulation to buttress the case for reproductive and abortion rights. I don't need to go there. Uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle urged action to lower birth rates, and even Republican President Richard Nixon signed into law a commission on population growth in the American future. But the culture wars of the 1970s subsumed and reconfigured population issues. On the right, the pro-life movement that crystallized in the wake of the Supreme Court's 1973 Roe v. Wade decision considered any talk of population reduction anathema. And now, of course, the right, as of a couple of weeks ago, is uh, the, uh, the anathema, the anathema of any talk of population reduction by any means is bigger than it has ever been. Uh, anybody talking about overpopulation now 
uh, after that shit that went down a couple of weeks ago, guys, it, it is worse than you could possibly imagine. And of course, China's one-child policy, which might have something to do with the young lady uh, visiting today, launched around 1980, led to serious human rights abuses that allowed anti-family planning conservatives to paint all population programs in a negative light. Conservatives subsequently ignored China's significant reforms to the policy, as well as research indicating that slowing population growth, in fact, contributed to China's economic miracle. I would love to uh, interview these people from China about this, but I don't think probably not a good thing for an Airbnb host to be interviewing people from China about uh, their views on population control. Anyway, as much as I would like to, obviously, I got to keep my mouth shut. More, moreover, newly ascended anti Keynesian economists rejected an older consensus that slowing population growth would yield economic benefits. These market-oriented economists asserted that denser populations created economies of scale and that individual fertility decisions would adjust to any temporary population problems. President Ronald Reagan, who once had dabbled with Malthusianism, tellingly labeled advocates who worried about scarce resources as doomsday prophets. Thank you, Ronald Reagan, for uh, picking my future life. After Congress eliminated national origin immigration quotas in 1965, immigration rose steadily and accounted for a growing share of population growth in the U.S. In this context, white liberals increasingly risked being branded racist for supporting population reduction. Yes, you are a racist if you suggest, I guess, anyone but white people are having too many kids. You are a racist. If you point out that uh, millions uh, or what is it, two billion uh, non-white children on this planet looking at starvation, you say that. You are a racist. By the late 1970s, both liberals and conservatives had bought into exaggerated talk of an aging crisis. Too few workers to pay for the bulge of baby boomers headed towards retirement. This perspective bolstered calls for higher birth rates and further reduced the sting of the overpopulation critique, and of course that has gone into overdrive with Elon Musk and all of these other clueless morons. Today, Ehrlich is a largely forgotten prophet, although some small population-centric organizations continue to tilt at windmills and the mainstream press occasionally dips its toes in the water. Uh, I see no sign of that. After some very public rifts over immigration policy, mainstream environmental groups generally avoid or downplay the issue, do you think so? And of course, meanwhile, the right continues to dismiss talk of population problems. Looking back with the benefit of time, and this again is according to this dude, it is clear 
Ehrlich was wrong to view population as all-encompassing. For the record, I categorically reject that statement. Okay, uh, I have I I have seen nothing, uh, nothing, uh, to to show that Ehrlich was wrong for viewing population as all encompassing. It, it, it is the foundation of everything that's wrong on this planet. It is the all encompassing reason for every single problem on the planet. Uh, where this clueless moron gets off saying something that, but anyway, this is his rant, not mine. Uh, so he makes that statement and does nothing to back it up. In addition, the global total fertility rate has declined more than he anticipated. Although the development and modernization that has helped lower birth rates, a process known as the demographic transition comes at great environmental cost. You know, talk, talking about, uh, you know, what he's talking about here is the more money you have, you tend to have fewer children, but, you know, if, if, if you're twice as rich and your two children uh, consume as much of the planet as as your four children would have done before you had all of this extra cash, it's a zero, so it doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> Ehrlich underestimated human ingenuity. No, I, I, I don't think, uh, I, I, I think he completely uh, nailed human ingenuity to be clueless morons. Uh, I see no evidence that Paul Ehrlich has underestimated human ingenuity to breed themselves into their own extinction. And for now, I, I, I love this one, one can reasonably argue that food insecurity remains primarily political rather than technological in Ehrlich's own words, the weaknesses were, quote, not focusing enough on overconsumption and equity issues. And of course, the bottom line being someone who is never born consumes nothing. But he got much right, even if many details in his timing were off Global population has increased at a remarkably steady rate since 1968, and the UN projects that it will reach 9.8 billion by 2050 and 11.2 billion by 2100. Now, of course, they have lowered those numbers, as I mentioned in my rant. So those numbers are four years. They're always, tink every year they come out, nobody knows how many humans are on the planet today and uh, they sure as hell have nobody has any clue how many people are going to be on this planet uh, in 2050 or 2100 uh will there be over 11 billion people on this planet by 2100 you don't have to be an alt near-term human extinction clueless moron to question the UN's figures that there's going to be 11 billion people on this planet by the end of this century. <clears throat> Scientists continue to extend his prescient warnings that efforts to feed all these people through pesticide intensive monoculture may backfire and although Ehrlich exaggerated the threat of mass starvation, about 8,500 young children die from malnutrition every day. 
and that was four years ago, and uh, everything is gone. Uh, as I was reading with that 2022 uh, World Hunger Report yesterday from the UN, uh, a hell of a lot more than 8,500 young children who should never have been born are dying from malnutrition every single day. Human-driven climate change is an overriding threat and is unambiguously worsened by population growth. The IPCC estimates that limiting warming in this century to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit would require cutting global greenhouse gas emissions 40 to 70 percent by 2050 and nearly eliminating them by 2100. Uh, yeah, right. This is quoting the IPCC in 2018, quote, globally economic and population growth continue to be the most important drivers of increases in CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion, close quote. There lies an enduring flaw in Ehrlich's approach. If impact equals people times affluence times technology, then reducing population alone is not sufficient to solve our ecological crises. But reducing affluence is neither possible nor desirable since it would condemn millions to lifelong poverty. Ultimately, the population bomb offered no road map for transitioning away from capitalism without causing human ruin as serious as the environmental ruin that seems to be our destiny. Yep, yep, yep. Human ruin versus environmental ruin, like those are two different things. You have human ruin over here and you have environmental ruin over here which is implying that environmental ruin does not include humans. So we can ruin the humans or we can ruin everything else on the planet including the humans which seems to be our destiny because it is our destiny. Read the t-shirt and anyway the lightning bug show will be kicking off shortly and I gotta go take my Chinese guest to a lightning bug show. Get out there and enjoy your lightning bug show while you still can. My guys. Yes, little dog, you're not gonna join the lightning bug show. No, you're not. <laughs>